product. So remember that the goal we had was to try to explain what equality should mean once you impose types, because types are these very basic things where you have to tell everybody what rules are applying to these data. Once we put types on there, we do not necessarily know what means to be equal unless we teach ourselves and the machine what equal means. And we've been using the Martin Roth identity type. And now what I want to do is come by and state an entire theorem in types. And this is to illustrate the propositions as types philosophy. That's what Martin Loft says at the beginning of his notes is his goal. Our goal is to lead into homotopy type theory and the beautiful stuff that's going on there, this connection to categories. But this proposition of this types is what opens the door to this question. So the proposition we're doing is the world's easiest proposition, the first actual algorithm on the world, as far as I know, the division algorithm. And the way we would state that, if we were just stating this in some kind of initial number theory course, we would say, for every natural number, I'll make that one M, and for every positive natural number, which my notation today will just be to put a plus on the N, so my N's have a zero, my N pluses start at one, there exists a natural number Q, and there exists a number R, which is not more than N, so I will use the notation less than N here to mean it's a natural number, and it also happens to be less than N, such that M is equal to Q, the quotient, times N, plus R, the remainder. Like I, it's a non-controversial theorem. You could certainly prove this for yourselves on a small piece of paper. But that's assuming that you've already fully understood all the gadgets that are there. And that's what we're really focused on. It's not this theorem that's pretty basic, but unwrapping that as a type. So now, I want you all to help me translate all the symbols there into types that we've built at this point, and ones that we haven't built, we'll have to start introducing. Then the goal will be to lead us to a place where we can actually inhabit the type. That means this statement, which doesn't have a proof, this is a type. The proof is an element of this type, or is an inhabitant of that type. So the second round is to actually make something of that type. That means write a program. So help me out. What can I do? I start from left to right. I encounter a for all M and N. What should I write down? What, what type building do I use when I want to replace a for all? Or maybe we should back up even before that. What about N, capital N, natural numbers? Do we know what to write for that? It's here in a lot of places, so you should at least have that one, right? Okay, so the first one is, what is n? Well, so the formation rule doesn't depend on anything to have existed before it. We just need n to exist. We have two introductions. You always get a zero to be a natural number. And if you had another natural number already, you would get a successor. How do you use a natural number? Addition rule. The addition rule. I don't know what that one is exactly. Yeah, the numbers we use of induction. Induction, right? So induction is what we do on natural numbers. So that's the elimination rule. Is the principle of induction. which I think writing it is better than writing the symbols, but let's go ahead and do our best to describe this. The principle of induction is if I have evidence for P0, and if I have for, maybe I'll do it this way, if I happen to have um, Prove it a little bit. So what I'm saying is, and I'll, I'll call that one now F0 just to have it fit in our notation. I have evidence of type P0. P is some some type that's indexed by these zeros. I have a function from Pn to Pn plus one. Then I should say for all n, in n 
I'm going to change the types in a minute, but for all in an N, I should have um, some type uh, evidence F0 Fn of type P N. Okay, so the point that I want to do though is I want to say this without doing an N already existing kind of thing, right? I don't want to have like this N business here. I don't want to have this for all n. So what I do is I just say, well, for any particular n, I need to get to where I want to go. So given an m of type n, then there is a path that depends only on the data given and m, which has type p. Okay. So there's a an initial place, there's a bunch of functions that take any evidence of this type to evidence of that type, and any inhabitant of this one to an inhabitant of that one, and then there's some target one, and then I get to this. And then finally, the computation rule. This is the principle of recursion. And that just says, do what you think you're supposed to do, right? I need to tell you how to create this path. So if I start with a natural number. So for example, if I start with zero, then I know exactly what the path should do. It should just be whatever F zero was. Right? That's evidence of type P zero. I need evidence of type P zero in the case of zero as the input. Sorry, this M is now zero. Okay. So there's always that one, it's just give me the base case. And the recursion step is well, I'm coming through this path. So if I happen to have a K of type N, then my path for the successor of K is what? So if I come through this path to create the successor of K, and I'm going to pass the successor of K in as this M here, then I'm going to have path, depending on these parts F, and the successor of K, and it has to be of type P of successor of K, right? So it has to be of type P of K plus one, if you like. I should have written it as N plus one, I apologize. Nobody spotted it because we all make the agreement that plus one means successor. Well, what I have is by induction, I can have a path of just K, right? That's the induction principle or the recursion principle, right? I'm going to apply this function, the set of functions to the K values and go through whatever those do. By induction, I already have that. I apply f of n to the result, in this case, f of k, and that makes it of type to the successor of k. So it's just a recursive function. Make a call that's on an infinity. Okay. This is a pretty sort of vanilla version of induction. This is not like your fancy inductions that you could see when you're writing proofs. But it is indeed a, a decent form of induction. We still use that even in the strict kind of one domino, next domino kind of way. From here, you can soup it up with skipping dominoes or using several initial cases, stuff like that. You can, you can generalize. But if you have this, you're already on your way to inductions of the kind you've seen in your life. Okay. That's the natural numbers. So we've got the natural numbers done. What about this for all that we skipped over? A product, yes, right. So we said it was a pi type. So we'll do product type M colon N, and then more stuff will come. Right? Let's see if I can keep this for Dustin and everybody. Maybe I'll just slightly move it there. Apologies to all of you who are trying to read this. Okay. So the pi type will cancel this thing here. The pi type will also work there. So let's go ahead and finish these out. The next part of that will be a pi type. What will be underneath here? And a type N. An N colon or type N plus. N plus. We'll have to write down what N plus is over here. We'll do that in a second. Uh, that'll take care of this. So we've got care of the for all. We've got the ends, we've got this for all. We haven't described the n plus. We'll come back to that. What about the existent? The sum, the big sum for sum, right? It's the joke of the notation, right? But it's helpful if you speak English to know that trick. So sum q 
of type, in this case, just any natural number applies. And then what would I put next? Sum R. Sum R of type we haven't defined yet, but we called it N less than R N. Okay, so that's gonna take care of these two. And then what goes in the next line? Um, Careful, so you got to be a type, not a term. So it's evidence, not a... Evidence is data. We want M equals N, QN plus R. And this is the part that most of us, by not having thought of equality for our lives, have a hard time seeing this as anything but a true false thing. Something is equal or it's not. But that's not the question we're asking now. We're saying, there is a proposition that they are equal. I claim that you're equal. Now either that my claim is true or false, there's a proof or not a proof, but the claim is a data type. It's evidence, inhabitants, it's data, is a proof or a disproof. Either it has a proof, meaning there is evidence, or there is no evidence and we can't give a proof. So what we need is a type here, and I'm gonna write it two different ways. The first one is the very technical notation for Martin Loff identity types so that you think of it as a data type because somehow writing it in the shorthand notation makes us not think of data types, it makes us think of Boolean true false stuff. So what I'm going to do is create an identity type, so I'm using ID for identity type. Now it's identity type of some other type of data. The data that we're talking about here is all what kind of things? Natural, Natural numbers, so it's going to have a little n at the bottom of that. Okay, and then I need a pair of things to create that. This is a dependent type. It depends on two terms. Now those are no longer types, those are terms. So what goes in those two spots? M, Q, N plus R. And so one of them is M, and then I didn't leave myself much room, but it's a whiteboard, so I solved my problem, and it's Q times N plus R. Now that's a formula. But we know that if we've defined these things, that formula will reduce down to a natural number. So then I have two natural numbers, and I have an identity type of those two natural numbers, and that's just a data type. Now, that's not the notation that most programming languages use. I'm not suggesting that that's what they do, but each one of these can be written in a programming language today. There are programming languages that have notations and syntax to write exactly what I wrote here. So instead of just saying div is def div mn and then do whatever, I now start annotating everything. So now everything in this thing starts to have m must be a natural number. That way it never makes a mistake of putting in something like a fraction or something for the division algorithm. N must be a positive natural number. That's capturing this for allness. Anybody that fits these two types can be passed to this function. What does it return? Well, now I start specifying the sum business, right? They're going to depend on those things, right? And now the notations get funny here. There's all kinds of weird notations because many programming languages have been resistant to inserting new symbols like times and plus. There are ways to do that if you're doing something like an Agda or clock or some of these other real proof theoretic type languages. You really can just type in some kind of a LaTeX command and hit tab and it becomes the symbol you want. In other ones you have to type in Unicode commands. Those are those alt different digits that you somehow randomly remember and then it puts the symbol up but it accepts it. However your language works you might need to fuss with it. Okay, so. I'm going to continue using these because I see no value in putting some crappy symbols up here to, to simulate that they're being used. I'm simply going to put some sum here, okay? So it's going to have a Q of type nat for natural number, and it's going to have R of type fin, and then it's going to have an N parameter saying it's a finite natural number depending on N. Okay? And then the last thing is, I give it the identity type, nat m q times n plus r. And this is a dependent type for sure, because you see that some of these data are part of the inputs. 
some of them are part of the output. So if it, was, if it didn't have the Q and the, the M and the N, that would be fine. You're just saying somehow these are all clobbered together in some weird formula. But it's dependent, so it's a dependent function. Okay? That's the nature of what we're headed towards, is to write a program so succinctly, not so succinctly, so verbosely, the opposite of succinct, so verbosely that once the system is reading this code, it can never be wrong. That's a formal method. So a formal method is when you write programs that in the way that they're written, they're self-documenting in a sense. They are telling you a theorem. Now, however you choose to program this, however creative or uncreative you are about this, you cannot get this wrong. The program will be correct. Now, it could be several programs. But whatever program you come up with will be a proof of division because the type forces that to happen. That's the key idea. That's the kind of first reason people looked at this. Now, of course, we don't want to stay here because that's not the most exciting question to have solved. We already knew how to divide. Ships have been doing this so reliably for so long, you would just call the command slash, right? You wouldn't make your own. So this would be a waste of your time. But if you can't do this, then you're somehow missing the idea that's going on here for something sophisticated. So now, let's try to fill in a few other types, and then I want to talk about inductive types in general. Okay? So I'm going to come over here and just for practice, let's try to make some new types. For example, how about we make n plus? And also, since we're here, we ought to justify that we have the right to talk about this and this, which doesn't appear in anything we wrote. Right? I wrote plus and times, but those are things that we have to teach because nothing in our data type knows anything other than what we teach it. This is the upside of set theory, is that you can have things that are just true and you never had to teach it. Type theory says, well, I want to take away the mystery of sets and just have things that you have to tell me. Downside is, I mean, the upside is you can prove things with that on a computer, but the downside is you have to teach everything. Okay, so let's start before I erase this with explaining what it could mean to add. So m plus n, well, okay, first of all, it's a function. Plus takes a pair of natural numbers and spits back another natural number, right? And we have a function type. We've talked about that last semester, so we're happy with that. We just need to give what it does on inputs. And so if I add m and n as my input to my plus function, I'm writing it in a goofy way right now to remind us it's a function and not give us intuition. It's just a case function. Why is it a case function? It's because of this. The only way you get information out of a natural number is through its elimination rule. And that says you must use cases, right? It says then the computation rule. It says you must do something for zero separately from what you do to success. We're forced to do cases because that's the elimination rule. So it's a if n equals zero kind of situation. Then what should you do if you add zero to something? Return. So I'd return m, right? Not a big surprise. It shouldn't surprise us. We're trying to design what we know should work, but we're trying to write it in the program. What should happen if it's a successor then? That's the other case, right? So n might be the successor to some number k. What's the sum then? Successor plus. And how did you come up with that? Staring at the combination. OK, so it's, it's somewhat obvious. It has to be recursion. It has to call something on k, and then it can modify it by some function f. In this case, the function f is just the successor. If so it did. The yeah. previous notation would it be plus m common k? Yes. So yeah, successor plus mk to match that notation. Okay. So I'm not, I'm not trying to surprise us. I'm trying to show you that it's actually boring enough that a machine will probably fill this in for you. If you bother to write this much syntax, then you just do command completion, and the, the, the various systems will search out the only possible proof you could be thinking of. It'll fill out the program for you. And that's the really like long-term goal, is to just have machines write their own code. right? And they do that. In Idris, you can do this. Okay, for something this small. For something really complicated, you need to give a hint. So you put in things called hold, which are like 
I know how to get this far, what do you think? And it says, oh, I fill in the hole with this, and then you're left with more things it doesn't know, and you give it more clues. And over time, you sort of tab complete your way all the way through a beautiful little program. But it requires you to be able to think like a mathematician and write all of this as the meaning of your function. You have to carefully know what you're trying to say. Um, so now let's take an opportunity here to give ourselves a use of the identity type. That's the whole reason we're describing this. It's not because we want to do division. So let's ask, what's a property of addition that you think is true? Uh, for natural numbers? For natural numbers, yes. Uh, it commutes. It commutes, okay. What's another one? Associative. It's associative. What's another thing it does? Uh, At zero doesn't change. Let's start with that one because it's the easiest one to write down. Okay, so let's try to show that zero plus something, and we'll start it this way. Yeah, that pen's not going to show up. Let's take m plus 0 equals m. That's a claim. And what's the proof? Just before we think of types, just at the high level, mathematically, you would say it's the definition, right? I mean, it's right there. Okay. Now that's what we would write maybe as a like mathematician who's trying to explain it. So I could define it. I defined that if you put zero there, then it's zero, right? Now what's the difference with the claim like this? And I go to the proof. M plus zero equals M, I just look up the definition and I say done. Just filled it in with the definition. M plus zero what definition was zero, what was N was M, and I'm done. But what about 0 plus n equals n? Can I just cite the definition that I have, or do I have work to do? Yeah, so I have to actually do some reduction. 0 plus n, I look it up. And n falls into two cases. This is either n is already 0, and then I put in this one. OK? And then externally, I observe that 0 is 0 because n was 0. So that is 0 on this side, and it's also 0 on that side, so it works. Right? And ultimately, the reason this one works in this case is the reflexive law, 0 equals 0. Right? So from here, maybe I'll just chase this, this case out in words. It'll be very useful. I'm going to erase some things. I apologize for keeping this much up. Get a real map. Yeah, that's how we'll finish it, but I want to actually get the whole thing up here at least once so that we practice this idea. So 0 plus n equals n is a claim which will turn into a proof, or which we'll give a proof for. Then we're going to turn this into a what? Claims become types. So this is the whole thesis that propositions are types. So what is the type that I would write? The data type. I zero plus n. I do I E of what kind? Of type uh, natural number. Natural numbers, because that's the data I'm talking about. And then it's a dependent type. It depends on two values, two terms, and those values are zero plus n. Zero plus n. Thank you, Tatum. And there. Okay. So now I go and I program that little data type into my system in whatever syntax it requires. And now that's just a piece of data. That's like a class. To make an instance of it, to do new whatever, I need to give it some information that fits the introduction rules. What is the only introduction rule available to an identity type? The reflexive one. And that means it has to have a single value of this thing. It has to be an AA. And a single A will give me evidence of the reflexive constructor. So look for that in our proof to pop out. That somehow the only way we prove this in the end is because something equaled something, where the somethings were the same. So in our proof, if I want to prove this using the definitions, I first say the case n is 0. So 0 plus 0, by definition, is this 0. Okay, it looks like too many zeros, you can't tell which one's which, but we go to our definition, and n gets slotted in as the answer when the second variable is zero, which is the case we have. 
zero equals zero by reflexivity. So this side is zero plus zero by definition. This side is n by assumption. Right? Two different reasons that they're both zero. But now what I can do, and this is backwards to how we teach it. We often teach that you go from this side to that side. But the way we have to think about it in type is we start here. We have an axiom that says zero is equal to zero. The reflexive law made this true. Definitions made these two others true. Therefore, when I come back to here, I can see how to inhabit the type. If I want to actually create zero plus n equals n, sorry, if I want data of this type, I'll do reflexive of zero has type identity n zero zero by axiom, right? That's the one introduction law we're allowed for the identity type. Then I use rewriting to say that this is the same as zero plus zero comma zero. Right? It's the rewriting of this definition here that allows that to be equal. And now I've inhabited the type 0 plus 0 equals 0. Okay. But that's not enough. What's the rest of the cases? Case 2, n is the successor of k. And this gets really boring quickly because we all know what's going on. This is not, the goal is not to actually do this in any great detail, but to do enough really junky, simple ones that you really trust that this is working because it seems like, how could this go wrong? And then you let the machines take over, right? You just don't know when you want to let the machines take over, so you should do a few examples until you trust them. By definition, what do I rewrite this as? I come over here, my definition chart, I'm a machine, I'm not allowed to think. I just say, oh, it's a successor type, so it must be successor of a plus. And here, I'm not going to stick with the outfix or the prefix notation. I'm just going to do this, just because we understand that better in our minds. Okay. That's just the definition. And now it's recursive, right? So now the program could, if it knew the number k was 7, it could keep rewriting this forever. But it doesn't know the number is 7. It's any k. This is where you need dependent types. Your programming language has to know how to handle that this is a variable type. Okay, So what's really happening underneath the covers inside your computer program is it's actually thinking of this as a function. And it's just rewritten it as this function. Okay, So what it's really passing along to the next stage isn't the value s is 0 plus a variable. It's actually passing on a little function, a little lambda to each step. It's just technical detail. All right, now that it's got this, what do I want it to equal? Successor of k. So what do I have to do? So I want this to come out as successor of k, right? I need to apply the induction rule, which was part of our elimination. I inductively know that 0 plus k reduces to k. So now I'm allowed to rewrite like this because this is an inductive type. That's something I teach the computer is that if you're in an inductive type, when you have anything that's a lower term, you can just replace it with the rule you're trying to rewrite with because that was an induction principle. So now I get to write that by induction. And that's what I do over here. So now reflexive of zero, or sorry, of, of k, sorry. Right, that's the first one here. This has type k equals k, um, identity type. Reflexive of k is identity type nat kk. That's because that's the only constructor. I am allowed to rewrite this as what? By induction. Remember, we go backwards. We internally unwrap it. So induction, let me rewrite k plus k as, or sorry, 0 plus k as k. That was by induction. Okay. But that still doesn't have successors on anything. But 
this is where you apply Martin Loss elimination. Martin Loss identity elimination rule said that if you had two things that were equal and you applied a function to both sides of the equal signs, they stay equal. Only the equal sign is being written in this weird notation, identity of blank blank, the two things you want to make equal. So what function am I going to apply to both sides of my equal sign? The successor. The successor. So now this is path of the reflexive law of K has type identity. Sorry, it's path with respect to S of the reflexive law of K has type this. Okay, so we just went from k equals k to um, 0 plus k equals k. We applied the induction, sorry, that was induction. We applied the Martin loss. Why are two functions, or what, what, what makes things equal? Well, if functions can't tell them apart law, right? That was the identity of, sorry, that was the unit. It was the Leibniz law. That's the word I'm looking for, right? The Leibniz law said two things are equal if and only if all their properties are equal. So we got to this now with the S's on it, and the final rewrite is to rewrite zero of S plus K as what? Nope. Zero plus successor of K. Successor of K. That proves that the missing case when n was non-zero didn't affect it. And please do this only for like two or three more layers of questions because there's not that much learning in what we're doing here. Okay, like you need to see and trust that each of the rules isn't missing a step. But nobody really thinks about the granular detail here. That's missing the point of this exercise. Okay, but it can be done. And it's so automatic. Once you do a few of these, you realize you really should just be able to hit next on the computer. And it should be able to guess what would go here. And you could supervise it and say, I think that's right or wrong. But it really cannot be that creative. After all, the only thing you're putting into the system is the reflexive law. I mean, like, it really isn't starting from any deep ideas. So, so really, all our computer needs to check is just the existence of that path S. It doesn't need to reduce everything to a reflexive law. Like I don't need to. No, it actually does have to know that reflex. What it's going to do? Well, it knows that one. But I'm it's going to know reflexive of K has type ID of KK. Do we need to reduce ID natural numbers S of the successor functions to some reflexive law? Itself? It will need to do everything that I've put on the board. Okay. It or you. Depending on how smart your machine is, it can search out paths, and, and that's a convenience. That's called type inference. When a machine is sort of saying, I bet you mean this type because it fits, and it guesses correctly and checks that that's a correct de you know, derivation. But, but you can't skip these steps and expect it to be correct. Okay, so this is, this is incredibly tedious, but that's the nature of these things, is to show that it can be done at this level of granularity. Now, we'll come back to this other one of the division algorithm but I want to leave that there for you all to choke on. Um, just to quickly hammer out this, well, actually leave it. I'll leave the types all together because I want to move on to something connected to categories again. We're going to try to lift this to much more interesting types, much more interesting data than something as simple as natural numbers. And so one way to do this is to connect induction to freeness. So this proposition as types thing says, well, suppose you make a proposition in which you prove something using recursion. So that the theorem is an inductive proof, uh, is an inductive theorem, right? Well, that's a proposition thing. That's a language of, of proofs. If we write that in the language of types, we get something that we can machine verify along the way, and we can learn different properties. But what if we want to connect this to categories? One of the things we've seen is that a lot of the rich data types come with some categorical thing to go with it. What are we seeing if we move into this land of categories? 
What creature lives there? Now we know one inductive structure is the natural numbers, right? I think it was Luke who did this example where you sort of take a dot and add an edge, and you can count if you do this. So natural numbers don't need much of an interesting category. A dot and an arrow will do it. Dot, arrow, dot, arrow, dot, arrow, just keep going, right? You can start to count. So it's not too surprising that you can get category theory to do the natural numbers for you. But what else could you do that induction in the more full-throated induction that we know about? Things like, you know, strong induction, Wundotherian induction, uh, well-ordered induction, all these other types of inductions that you use on a daily level, they're much more powerful inductions than what we've just done here. What happens to their types? And the answer roughly is free. Okay. Free without any relations. So now let me try to demonstrate that. So the natural numbers, the way we've defined them, needed a zero and a successor function, okay? So what I want you to do is think about some other free objects, maybe even with the same objects, but I'm gonna think of the natural numbers as an algebra with a plus and a zero. Now that's gonna be an algebra where we can take whatever's been going on there and think it's generated by one element, right? Take the number one, you keep adding one several times, you'll get all the other natural numbers, and we throw in zero as an operator a nullary operator, okay? So this is a perfectly fine free, in fact, free commutative blah, 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 but the commutative part is because it's just one generated. What if I want two symbols in my, in my free thing? So I want something that's free on plus and zero, but on a set with an X and a Y, okay? What kind of objects are in that kind of a free free algebra? So I claim x is in there. x, y, x plus y. Okay, so I think elements that are in here include x, they include y, they include 0, they include x plus y, and y plus x. y plus x is in there. x plus x, y plus x. x plus x plus 0 is in there. Do you see what I'm doing? What's a nice description of this algebra? Um, all words with. Yeah, I can tell that um, that you were raised by wolves when you say that, right? Because you said words. And, uh, and we algebraists are the wolves in this situation, where we neglected to assume that the world was possibly ever non-associative. Right? So words make sense when everybody's associative. You don't need to worry about when one letter starts and ends, right? This one had parentheses in it. We have to be more careful. Sorry, Amari, you were raised by perfectly well-intentioned people who, like me, didn't know there were other things in groups for a while. Okay. But you might take a picture like this into mind. Okay. This would be a way to write x plus y in a way that doesn't give away parentheses. So now if I wanted to add something to this, I would see that my structure, my tree structure, gives me the notion of who to pair where. So when I have a binary operation, then I have a branch with two legs. When I have a unary operation like minus, so I could have something like a minus sign, I could have x, a minus, and I get a minus x, and then a plus and a y, so it's doing minus x plus y. Basically, every expression you're going to ever write is just a tree in which the variables are at the bottom. Any constants like 0 or 1 are allowed as leaves. And everything else is a branch in this tree that you label the edges for. And you just need to know the, the number of branches, right? And the order, if you want. Like, if, 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 because this isn't commutative, x, y isn't y, x. Okay. And because we don't have any relations, we know that associativity won't hold. Like, these get registered as always these two separate Yeah, things. two different trees are two different formulas. So these are just polynomial formulas, but without any extra assumptions of rewriting. Okay. So that's what a free object is in any algebraic system. You give me a bunch of symbols, you tell me how they work. You know, are they binary, are they ternary, you know, left, right, whatever they are, and you write all the trees with those labels, and that's the free algebra. And how do you multiply or add things? You just kind of glue them into the tree according to the rules. That's it. That's the whole algebra. Okay? Now words can fit in here, right? All kinds of things can fit. So these are generalized polynomials or parse trees or syntax trees or all kinds of different names that are every community has found the same object useful in their lives. 
How do you use a polynomial? Evaluate. You evaluate a polynomial. So let's write that down in a type theoretic language. So first we need x, which is a set. Notice I said set, not type. That's a next semester kind of question. <laughs> okay. There is a subtle difference. If you just use type here, you run into the issue of types don't have to have an equal sign. So therefore, is the letter x the same as the letter x? You can't tell certain things. You can't evaluate consistently without an equal sign. So there's an issue of needing a set here, but that's a really technical issue. We'll get a free thing. By the way, I'm fixing a signature, which for purposes of illustration is just going to be plus and zero. But put plus, minus, put times, inverse, whatever. Fit, fit whatever famous, exciting operators fill your life with joy. We're going to build a new type called free, and it's really just the polynomial formulas on x using only the symbols in the operating set omega or sigma. Okay. So that's the formation rule. I need some introduction rules for my free type, and they're pretty straightforward. If I have an x, I have something in the free thing that corresponds to that x. And just to keep track of whether it was the x or the thing in the free one, I'll put an e sub x. But we often just write it as the letter x, OK? That's a little bit of abusive notation, but now let's be precise. So the letters x make it into the list. What else makes it in the list? Just using the signature plus and zero so we don't have to go crazy. Oh, little. we already have this one. I want to be able to, to glue them together. And well, why don't we start with the easier one? Zero has to be in there, right? And that depends on nothing. So zero is a free thing. Right? And then that would allow me to put zero at the bottom, x as a leaf, or e sub x as a leaf, but I still haven't glued anything together. So I want to introduce things that allow me to glue together, but what am I allowed to glue it together in this algebra? Just a plus sign. And that depends on two lower things that are already in the algebra, right? So that just means I need a u and a v that are free, that are in the free thing. Now maybe they're x and y, but they could be x plus y or whatever, some crazy evolved thing. And then I have something I'll call u plus v is the next thing in here. And if you've ever built a tree data type in a programming language, you've done this. But now I want you to see it as a free algebra. It's just a polynomial formula. Free algebras are just the set of polynomials in the language that you have, the variables and the symbols you have. No extra rules yet. We'll get to extra rules when we do homotopy type three. <laughs> okay, so this is the this is the free algebra without any any rules at all. What's the elimination? Then we'll quit. Well, I guess we should finish with C and then we'll quit. If I give you some tree, the whole point is to use it. We already said it was to evaluate the polynomial, right? So if I have a polynomial, P of X, which is some free thing, and here I'm using the word polynomial to mean whatever formula came out of this. And what else do I need to evaluate a polynomial? You need some things. Some values, absolutely. So values, how can I think of values? Well, I need one for each variable, right? So maybe I take a function x into some other algebra, a. So a is a sigma algebra, meaning it has all the operations that sigma does, so plus and zero in this case. And I just take a function from x to u to a. That just means values in A. One for X, one for Y, one for Z, one for whatever letter you have. Well, then there should be an evaluation. Which I would always, uh, to be honest, I would always write it as P of U, right? But I'm just emphasizing that you would think of this as a function which takes in the formula and takes in the thing to be evaluated. And it computes what type of a thing will come out. If you evaluate a polynomial, it values in some algebra A. Elements in algebra A. Okay? Now, before we get too crazy, 
Here's my free of x thing, abbreviated. Here's my x thing. I have one introduction rule that gave me a function from x to free of x, right here. Now I've been given a function from x to an algebra A called u. And the result is I'm able to turn anything in free into something in A, which means I have a function from here to there. And what should happen with this triangle? Come on. It ought to commute. And that's our computation rule. Our computation rule is under the assumption that it comes from one of these three things, right? So computation rule has to mimic each one of these three through this. So if it comes from x, then p of, uh, so if x was the thing we create, right? Then e of x is replacing the p, okay? So if I evaluate my function u at e sub x, it's going to be u sub x. That's saying that if I start here and I go through here to create e sub x and then apply this transformation, it should be the same as just having gone down there. So the triangle commutes. That's what we just made happen. But then it has to be a homomorphism, right? This is more than just another line in the sand. This is a homomorphism between these two sigma algebras. How am I going to get that to work? Well, then I have to have, for example, that p of 0, uh, sorry, 0 is the, is the operator. So the 0 polynomial evaluated at any u is just 0. Well, there's nothing to evaluate in the 0 polynomial. You just put 0 back. That's just a holding up the isomorphism principle, or the homomorphism principle of that bottom arrow. And then the last one is supposed to actually have genuinely that my p is actually a u plus v, right, created this way. Uh, and then unfortunately I used the letter u in two different ways. Um, I'm going to change these here. Call that p and q. So now let's say that I had p plus q as the polynomial in, and I want to evaluate that at u. Then the last homomorphism theorem says that pq at u is just by definition p of u plus q of u. That's to make it a homomorphism slash it's also just giving the computation rule. I put to you the following claim that you should just let percolate because when I first heard this it just changed and warped my whole view of induction. Whatever induction proofs you have done in your lives you are evaluating a polynomial. Free algebra is the categorical way to think of induction. Evaluating a polynomial is induction. Now all the snifty stuff that you do on the side, they're extra rewriting rules. That's like induction with relations. That's like adding a commutative law to your free algebra and saying, well, now I'm allowed to also twist it as I do my evaluation. So that's like induction a little messed up. So you start to see how wild this can get. And to do that properly, we'll have to head to the homotopy direction. Okay. Let's meet back next week and see if we can pull off division.